I welcome you all in uh, today's webinar on Skill India, the road ahead or the future roadmap. Um, uh, we are very lucky to have two eminent academicians and bureaucrats uh, who have held very critical, very important positions in uh, our country. One is Professor S. S. Mantaji. Our second speaker is Dr. Manish Kumar. Mantaji uh, worked as chairman of AICT, All India Council for Technical Education. He is an engineer by education. He did his uh, BTEC in mechanical engineering from uh, MS University, Baroda. Then he did his uh, MTEC from BGIT. Uh, Mumbai, and uh, he did his PhD in combustion uh, combustion modeling from University of Mumbai. Uh, he has held various positions in uh, academics, and as I mentioned, uh, reaching up to the position of uh, chairman of AICT. He was also president of National Board of Accreditation and deputy VC of SMGP Women's University, Mumbai. Currently, he is serving as adjunct professor of National Institute of Advanced Studies in Bangalore. He has been awarded uh, honorary doctorate, doctorate uh, doctor of science by VT University, Karnataka, and by D.Y. Patil University, Maharashtra. Mantaji is a prolific uh, speaker and writer, and he frequently writes on uh, issues concerning technology, uh, concerning education, and uh, there are videos also and uh, uh, I, I re recently came to know that he has been uploading videos about you can say, educating people about blockchain technology and others and uh, he has uh, written a lot about uh, about uh, skills and in fact uh, the curriculum framework which was prepared long back he had a major contribution in that and uh, recently he wrote a paper for india policy foundation also on skill india uh, our second speaker is Dr. Manish Kumar. Manish Kumar ji uh, comes from uh, Indian Administrative Services. Aap, uh, IS Adhikari rahe hai, aur, uh, Tripura mein aap, uh, ke par secretary. He worked as secretary in uh, the government of Tripura also. And later on, he was he worked as uh, managing director and chief executive officer of uh, NSDC, National. National Skill Development Council. In between, he has worked with uh, on deportation. Uh, he has worked with UNICEF. He has worked with World Bank, and currently also he is associated with World Bank as a very senior consultant. Manish Kumar ji also uh, comes from uh, engineering background. He did his uh, BTEC in mining from uh, IIT Dhanbad, and later on he did his uh, uh, MPA from Harvard. Howard Kennedy School in Public Administration, MPA, and PhD from George Washington University in Institutional and Regulatory Economics of Public-Private Partnerships. So uh, today we have two, uh, you can say, uh, storehouses of uh, knowledge and experience. And I'm, I'm really looking forward to hearing you, all of you, and we, we are very lucky to have, you can say, very eminent uh, audience also. Uh, we have uh, Lalit Kumar Pawarji, who also retired as uh, Secretary of Tourism, Government of India, and also he was Vice Chancellor of uh, Skill University in Rajasthan. And we also have uh, other academicians, other very senior pro uh, professors. I, I'll have to, Brigadier Jeevan Rajproit is here, Professor Hemant Sharma is here, Brigadier Malhotra, Kapil Dev Malhotra is here. Uh, Professor Ninit Ranjan is here, Professor Sheila Rai. Professor Sheila Rai is our uh, chairperson, India Policy Foundation. She comes from Jaipur. Uh, she is also, she has also joined. Uh, Dr. Varun is here. Professor Vijay Kumar Paul is here. Vinod Jori ji is here. I may be missing out some names, but sorry. Uh, Sanjay Ganjuji is here, who has been working in the field of skill development for several years. Dr. Asad Ahmad is here, Amit Gupta ji is here, uh, Professor Amarji Lochan is here. So I, I welcome you all, um, people who come from academics and bureaucracy and industry. 
uh, all uh, segments we, are, we have here. I would request both the speakers. Uh, you can speak for 30, 35 minutes. We have enough time and then we will uh, have question answer sessions. Uh, Mantaji, you would like to start? Yeah. Yes, sir. Mantaji, please. Uh, Over to you, sir. First of all, uh, uh, good evening and uh, uh, Kuldeep ji, um, Manish ji, <coughs> and all the other uh, invited uh, guests here for the evening. Having said that, I <coughs> what I'll do is uh, uh, take you through the some of the concerns in the form of explaining what skill uh, you know skill mission is all about and probably what the concerns are in the implementation part of it and maybe suggest a few ideas for you all to uh, think over and maybe uh, you know uh, implement for much better uh, outcomes uh, what i'll do is uh, show you a small presentation if i is that fine uh, kuldeep ji so uh, without going into too many uh, details uh, we all understand what global competence and skill whenever we talk about skills uh, it's the competency based uh, skills so there is a certain uh, training that is given for a certain competence in a certain sector and we build skills for that competence so uh, fundamentally we need skills for two categories of people one is the skills required for those who are going to college since our gr or the gross enrollment ratio is about 26 today i'll call that 25 75 syndrome which means 25 to 100 are in the college and the rest of the people are probably dropouts or may have not gone to college or school or whatever now whatever school skills mission mission that we implement must be uh, applicable to both the groups albeit in a different in a different sense the skill sets will be required uh, required will be different but the record the recognition must be made uh, of the fact that both the groups need skills so within the first first of all i'm looking at the skills for those who are going to colleges and in that space we we talk about em, lack of employability skills and people uh, you know uh, wanting additional skills which are some of the institutions are able to do it some of the regulatory mechanisms that have been put in place are allowing people to do it and so on but still there is a certain gap which needs to be bridged for that, we need to look at how the industry is transforming. We all understand what is in uh, the new industry. That's complete automation. I mean, in a, a day will come when machines will talk to machines. In the earlier days, we, uh, people used to talk to the machines through programming and things like that. In times to come, complete automation, artificial intelligence, and so on will take over in every single area. And therefore, the students who are trained today they need skills in autonomous robots in simulation in uh, you know system integration in the, in iot cyber security and things like that so some of the institutions are uh, providing additional skill sets for these people to be trained in these uh, uh, you know through certification programs which are offered by third party providers and sometimes through experts in the institutions and so on so this is one area which needs a little closer attention. Then this is also needed because it affects the entire value chain in an industry. If, and the, uh, the slide here will tell you what, what is that value chain. It extends from end to end, from engineering design on one end to human resources on the other, global communications. You know, it, it affects every single uh, part of the value chain. So if, therefore, the students who are in the technical colleges or even in the science colleges and so on who, who get into support services and so on they also need skills in many of these areas that affect every part of the value chain then we all understand today 
there are several sensors around and there is internet of things anything that communicates is a thing and in in an internet of things on one side and product innovation process innovation you know autonomous agents the digital networking on the other side which forms the industry 4.0 we have between these two what is called as labor 4.0 therefore our engineers whom we create out of our colleges need to fill this gap of providing that labor 4.0 so they need training in digitized services in industry 4.0 in smart factories smart products and things like that now this is this is a uh, uh, I'll, I'll not go into detail of this. This just lists out the underlying, underlying drivers, the economic structure, the labor displacement, the emerging landscape in the entire industry space and the support services, the services sector and things like that. So this actually tells where the skills are exactly required and what kind of skills are required and so on. The next is in, in terms of soft skills that we talk about, there are several skills that uh, were listed in 2020, which several people have talked about. But one specific skill in this I would like to mention is a cognitive flexibility. Today, increasingly, students will require to fit into different spaces, which means they come with a certain set of skills. But on the job, they acquire additional skills and they must acquire additional skills and be able to fit into those uh, you know, challenging jobs in other sectors, in other areas, uh, which, which would be available, which means cognitive flexibility, the ability to adjust, you know, in different environments is, is a very important skill that will be required. Now, if I look at the entire world, uh, you know, the employment sectors, there are, there are seven sectors in which we can divide the entire uh, employment scene. For example, it can be engineering, it can be data science, it can be product, finance, marketing, and managers. These are the seven verticals in which jobs are available predominantly here today, whether uh, it's the primary se employment sector, the secondary, or the tertiary employment sector. But what the industry says is this is an essential skills map for digital transformation, which the industry leaders mentioned, are three skills which every everyone who goes to college today, in essentially in the uh, in the domain of science and technology are business skills, technical skills, technology-based skills, and data skills. For example, if somebody wants to make a career in finance, he would uh, obviously require mathematical finance, financial modeling, financial engineering as business skills. For technical skills, he will need Microsoft, Excel, VA, algorithmic trading, and, and so on. And out of data skills, he will need forecasting. Now, unfortunately, what happens is our colleges do not get into these areas at all. Now, therefore, there is a gap that exists when somebody would want to fit into a certain employment uh, space. So therefore, these, this is another slide that needs a little closer look and see how the curriculum is being mapped in our colleges to bridge those skill gaps. So future jobs, as we all know, are essentially in the care economy. Green Here, I, I would just like to point out one uh, important aspect of our employment scene. In the earlier days, we had a pyramid-like structure for employment where we knew, used to have entry-level jobs and more in number. And as you go up, the skill levels go up, but the numbers come down. But today, it's no longer so because of the uh, introduction of a lot of automation, artificial intelligence and artificial agents, as we call. And they have actually automated the entry level jobs, which means that the base of the pyramid is shrinking. And therefore we need higher order skills, even at the entry level, but reduced in number. And as we go up, the, the paradigm actually becomes like a pipe-like structure. Now, during the last two years, there is some lesson that we have to learn. The low skilled jobs were the hardest hit by COVID-19. And therefore we need to relook at the uh, what skills are required for a job for a for a bachelor's degree what skills are required for professional and therefore we need to understand this entire uh, you know space of employment versus skills that we have so collaboration communication critical thinking and creativity are the 
other skills that uh, we would uh, require. Now, this is a little bit of de uh, detailing. I would not really get into this area. Uh, the NEP talks about uh, you know multidisciplinary research and so on, but multidisciplinary research has a step before that. You, you, you just can't do multidisciplinary research just because we desire it. There are there is a there is certain uh, uh, building blocks that are required which have to come in place, and everything builds on builds on an approach to building skills for the future of work. So hands-on learning. There is a core that is required. There are multidisciplinary approach that is required, and then uh, from hands-on learning to core to emerging to multidisciplinary, you build a career. So that's how the skills uh, work. So there are different career paths available today. Based on that, the skills must be developed. Uh, guided projects is a concept which uh, has come in. So in the engineering colleges, there are several third-party providers like Coursera or Udemy or edX, they all get into this area of guided projects, provide internships and, and so on. So <clears throat> these slides, they indicate the career paths for job science students, uh, for jobs science students want, for technology students want, for art students want. And what this is actually mapping the current employment sectors. So in the chemistry area, in the mathematics area, in the biology area, this uh, these slides will be extremely important to build those uh, skill gaps. So there is something called as foundation, the prerequisites, the electives, the hands-on projects, and so on. Within the area of agriculture, there are tremendous opportunities for future ready, uh, you know, uh, if the students have to be future ready. So there are undergraduate uh, you know, agriculture based, uh, you know, studies. There are uh, courses available to upgrade those uh, skills. And that is something that the employment sector recommends today. And these are the possible opportunity career paths emerging out of agriculture for students. There is precision agriculture, there is supply chain tech, technology, crop quality management, transparency, visibility across supply chains. There are a lot of areas where agriculture is act seamlessly getting into uh, the use of uh, technology, application of technology, and that is where new jobs are being created. We also have seen uh, one of the recent Google announcements where uh, Google career certificates are being talked about, where they actually say that there are no, no degrees required, no diplomas required, but a set of skill sets are required to get into an employment sector. And uh, this is how they define, they, they, they define a pathway to jobs. There are uh, in-demand, high-paying roles, and, and so on. So they, they segment the entire employment scene in terms of actual skill sets that are required. Now, this is what I've talked about till now is about those who go to colleges. Now, that is just about 25 to 100. Now, that there is a large number outside that space, which is the 75% syndrome. In that, there are essentially two cases. One case is where they need skills, but they would also like to pursue school or college studies. They may be dropouts. They may have uh, gone out for some time. They want to come back into system, into the education system, but they are essentially interested in employment for their own well-being. And in order to meet that employment, they also have another goal of someday completing the uh, graduation or diploma or whatever. And the second case in the 75% syndrome is those uh, people who are not interested in any education per se. They are not interested in degree, diploma or whatever, but they are interested in skills which will allow them to be a small time entrepreneur or maybe get a appropriate uh, employment. So, uh, we all know there are so many uh, dropouts and things like that. Skills are terminal in nature. Therefore, uh, what IPIs and uh, ATIs, advanced technical institutions, they do they are build skills uh, which which are trade based. So, for example, somebody is made an electrician, somebody is made a plumber, things like that. So, these are trade based, uh, uh, you know, skill sets, and they. Uh, 
uh, will only allow a certain job and those skills are terminal in nature which means they do not have any any future on that so therefore the acceptance and uh, within the uh, uh, the students uh, uh, is very less for these uh, kind of courses or, or in in a generic term we say vocational education is not so very uh, looked at uh, favorably by the students so uh, another point is degrees and diplomas are not guaranteeing jobs today and UGC actually has a cafeteria based uh, courses which were popular at some time later on it went into you know a, a question uh, mark uh, what what was happening is along with the uh, degree uh, whether it's a bsc bcom or whatever uh, the students were allowed to take two additional skill based courses now the problem is what are those additional skill based courses which are available in a menu kind of uh, thing therefore it's called a cafeteria course from which the student choose to uh, skill uh, courses now this was not very popular over a period of period of time because students uh, one one reason is students were selecting whatever interested them not necessarily connecting to a employment uh, sector and the second is the institutions which were offering these uh, kind of skill based courses were purely looking at, at it as a business model now if they if there is some money in it for them to uh, you know get then probably they will do that uh, skill in the, in the college. They'll get probably the trainers and create infrastructure and so on. If there's no money, they won't, they won't do it. So that in effect, that, that the menu gets shortened and therefore the choices for the students were very, very less. In fact, similar things were happening with BSc Vocational, which in fact is a very good initiative for, for building skills and education together. Current education is expensive and it operates in a structured environment. But the NEP has addressed this to some extent in the sense that students are now allowed to drop out after first year, second year, third year, fourth year. The challenge really here is the how do we create the curriculum which actually connects him to an appropriate job after first year when he chooses to drop out, after second year when he chooses to drop out and so on. So therefore, it's very necessary that the employment scene is also mapped to the kind of education system that we would probably have in future and build competency based skills for a certain job role that is available. Otherwise, what will happen is people <clears throat> would probably uh, end up continuing uh, all the four years getting a complete degree and probably it's, it's business as usual. But if you really want to uh, we visualize the, uh, the the kind of uh, flexibility that is available within NEP. A lot more needs to be done in order to, in terms of mapping it to the exact industry requirements and creating content accordingly. As we all know, there are several vocational sectors. The, some of these are uh, accepted the worldwide. <clears throat> now, the idea that I'm saying that the first group of that 75 uh, syndrome. Uh, NSQF, as we all know, has several certification levels and there are equivalences created here. There is a vocational qualification, there is a certifying body, there is, uh, you know, in a uh, case, like for example, you have uh, voc vocational education, the, the levels of uh, study starts at uh, class 8, 9 and things like that and, in the, and it goes forward. Uh, every time you raise in the certification level, you get higher order skills. And by seamlessly building in, into the current education system, one can realize uh, both aspects of skilling as well as providing the student a degree or a diploma if, if he so wishes. But the flexibility is always there for him to get out of it at any certification level and come out uh, a, a, for an appropriate uh, job role at that level. In fact, uh, the Agnivir method, uh, the, uh, the scheme that has been announced would require something like this and implementation of that uh, should, will be extremely important. So typically the vocational framework that uh, we were uh, proposing was uh, so from every certification, every certification level should have certain uh, skill hours and certain education hours. And as the level increases, the skill level goes up 
and the education level comes down which means that the the person will acquire more and more skills as he goes in higher level of skills and therefore he becomes better employable and the education part in the initial years is kept uh, almost similar to what is happening in a conventional school that is because the chances of his wanting to go into professional streams or getting into the uh, current education system uh, and uh, coming out of the vocational education system if he so wishes all those flexibility features are built into this so therefore it's it's a win win for everybody in terms of uh, progress and in terms of acquiring skills uh, now this these two three uh, things now one important point that i wanted to uh, highlight here is when we there is a carnegie mellon credit uh, base which uh, defines the uh, the extent of study in a classroom and the level of skills that one acquires now what it means is in if in a classroom if i study for one hour i get one credit that's face to face learning and if i go to a lab and study two hours i get one credit now that that's a workshop part or a lab part that that's the hands on part this is a general carnegie mellon uh, way of defining credit but but that uh, the challenge is really in defining credits for skills for for example if i get let's say 4 hours of uh, skill training in an automobile workshop for engine uh, maintenance let let's say two wheeler engine maintenance is being uh, uh, taught as a skill and in there every day he spends 4 hours in the workshop now that 4 hours is how many credits and as against that in a different sector for example beauty and wellness if some of the skills in that sector are taught for 4 hours is that credit same as the credit that one acquires in within the uh, mechanical uh, you know the, the automobile sector so those kind of questions are also answered here in in these three four slides and this uh, actually this uh, this graph actually represents the certification level against the equivalent uh, credits and so on so it it uh, uh, actually uh, uh, you know uh, gets all the sectors into one frame of reference and it accounts for the level of difficulty within the sector at a certain uh, level and, and so on so this is extremely important if one wants to provide a degree and diploma and, and say that in the professional world this degree from a vocational system is as good as a degree in a uh, conventional uh, system now this is a typical credit framework where i have uh, tried to plot the education credits and the skill credits and the combined credits and how it moves across sectors now uh, there must be multiple pathways available as i said from one system to another system the complete flexibility must be available and the nsqf is built into this and therefore today technically there should not be any problem for anybody in any system to get into any other system with requisite skills and so on so therefore the student should not have any uh, misgiving on getting into the vocational system uh, and uh, believe that he would probably lose something if he did so so this this uh, shows the all the available pathways that are there now this that that was about the 75 syndrome and case one where i talked about students uh, who would want skills essentially but they may also want a uh, to pursue a degree uh, or a diploma as they go along uh, studying at their pace acquiring skills at their pace now the second part of that uh, 75 syndrome are students where they want only skills they do not want and for employment they are not really interested in acquiring a degree or a diploma and so on these are people maybe who have dropped out of the fifth the standard or eighth standard or whatever and probably there are people who have worked in a garage or for 10 years 15 years acquired some skills so therefore how do we recognize their pre prior learning uh, skills and and so on that's what this uh, framework talks about so here now the one again one important feature that we must understand here is the uh, uh, is the uh, uh, need for 
grouping of skills for employment and the need of certain basic uh, level of uh, uh, you know understanding of different aspects of leading a life for example i need communication skills not the entire grammar or things like that but i should be able to communicate in maybe in english or maybe in a local language and so on so this uh, also talks about providing those basic communication skills basic some basic things to understand the nature then uh, to understand the uh, computer you know the basic like how do you operate a computer how do you get into google how do you search and things like that basic accounting where you need to understand the entry uh, you know sing, sing, uh, your uh, uh, credits and uh, you know things like that so the basic accounting is something that uh, will be required in when you want to start a small business so then presentation skills grooming skills and we are also suggesting one additional uh, language besides the local language or, or his mother tongue that increases the uh, the mobility between uh, states and and so on that additional language could be a foreign language as well if the student chooses to maybe wanting to go out and so on now the idea is we don't need any brick and mortar things to do this we need an, an existing college an existing polytechnic whichever runs this nsq can be called a community college and therefore no brick and mortar institution is required existing polytechnics can do that engineering colleges can do that the only idea is they should follow nsq in letter and spirit flexible times and uh, uh, you know interface to the current uh, boards all that is uh, possible now i'll just give you a potential which will uh, tell you how powerful this entire skill mission can be we have almost 1.5 or 1.6 million schools in the country 40000 colleges in the country 10000 itis and we all know that most of them do not conduct any classes after 5 pm infrastructure that is there is lying waste so i mean somehow i'm not saying every one of that does that but most of them they don't do anything after 5 pm so they must be used to conduct the the train the nsdf programs from 5 to 9 pm saturdays sundays and so on if assuming i we create one division of 100 students in each school college and iti in any sector and any specialization that is defined by the local conditions then assuming only 10% of the above facilities are used you will create one uh, you know all these numbers have uh, given here uh, you know uh, one the, 20 lakh uh, students every year is what you can train now in order to do this you need financial scholarship models may be uh, created but you have pradhan mantri kaushal vikas yojana and thing, other thing they must be suitably uh, amended to fit into these uh, requirements one other uh, in, very important feature is most of our skills and today there are several skill centers there are contact there are trainers available there are skill centers available there are there is infrastructure created but somewhere there is some connect that is missing the the problem is one of uh, the, the uh, attaching them to the current universities is not a solution they are autonomous they have other jobs to do they are more interested in conducting ug pg programs the research and so on so therefore burdening them with skill education may not be the right uh, way to look at it there are too many skill centers there, of course, there are central bodies, the NSDC and the sector skill councils and so on, which keep, uh, uh, but, but the implementation uh, would always be uh, a, a problem area. Then too many bodies and center and state leads to desegregation. There's something that the center is saying, there's something that the state is actually implementing and therefore there is a conflict uh, there. So developing training center supply chains in various sectors across uh, you know, sectors is extremely important. If you look in Germany or France or, you know, uh, places like that, you have training center supply chains. Why can't we create that? In automobile sector, you find them. In textile sector, you find them and so on. In pharmacy, you find them. Creating and enabling and facilitating the regulatory environment is necessary. Affiliating all the, for example, suppose we create a national skill university. 
and we create regional centers in every district or even uh, you know uh, finer than that all these can use the standards and policies set by the central body and then they can implement and the students can approach the district centers and so on for whatever they have and the certifications can be authorized to be given by the, the regional centers by the central body and things like that so it can be a very good uh, scheme to uh, bring everybody in this space into under one umbrella though so the ultimate idea should also be to promote the make in india concept we need a blueprint for make in india which connects the skills that we are talking about the skills mission that we are talking about and uh, courses based on chosen sec the look the, the, the such a university can also do a lot of research in uh, areas which are forgotten today there are several uh, skill sectors which can provide a lot of uh, employment opportunity but we are not doing it because there is no uh, ecosystem that is available so the university can actually get into that area then develop technology enhanced curriculum they can uh, conduct train the trainer programs develop accreditation methods for trainers trainees they we can participate within the dublin and the sydney accord where the mobility increases for people who are trained here to get into other countries then uh, revenue models for sustainability has, needs to be there wired universities can be created collaborate with uh, american association for community colleges or in uk australia all that is possible you know uh, collaborating with industry bodies for placement we need to create a corpus with uh, central state and csr funds and create bonds for possible soft loan scholarships to fund the needy and so on finally we need to conduct skill melas in different uh, cities so something of that is actually happening but we need to look at the audit, audit the current uh, uh, you know events that are happening and see how they can be optimized and uh, to to uh, reach uh, the uh, reach almost everyone now for the for in the spirit in which the nsqf was uh, designed so uh, we have uh, all all these there can be uh, you know in that skill mela the the schools can be represented colleges can be represented trainers can be represented in another sector bankers ngo csr csr initiatives can be integrated and in the fourth sector we actually seek students out from active participation and from nearby communities and other interested in acquiring skills and they can do spot registration there through online or online registration and so on so there will be some central podium to information for dissemination of information in this process we create the uh, labor management information system which is extremely important for a country like india there can always be a, a blitz on skill media some collaborations will be required in order in order to do all this and that that's my uh take on the skills uh, mission there are a lot of things that can be done that can be spoken about but now uh, based on the questions you will have so uh, probably i will come back uh, once again thank you so much for the opportunity thank you thank you professor mantha ji uh, you elaborated how academics and uh, skill training can be uh, put together can be merged and can be utilized uh, efficiently for training our uh, youth and particularly in terms of the emerging uh, career emerging opportunities in the job sector in the industry where uh, <laughs> our, our not only our college students but also uh, students who are out of higher education system even in school dropouts they can be trained they can be educated uh, for the future challenges So thank you very much, sir, for uh, giving us uh, insights and very detailed uh, presentation, uh, particularly from academic point of view and also from uh, curriculum uh, point of view. We are uh, very happy, very excited to uh, have you here to hear you. Uh, we will come back to you when the questions answer session starts. Now I would request uh, Dr. Manish Kumar ji, uh, who worked as uh, managing director and chief executive officer. of uh, nsdc national skill development council uh, he comes from bureaucratic background and he headed the institution the, the council uh, which was uh, looking after the entire skill india uh, mechanism and uh, process so uh, now moving from academic to real implementation part so uh, over to you manish kumar ji 
uh, now uh, please provide us your insights, your uh, guidance. Dr. Manish Kumar. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for inviting me. And a uh, great pleasure to listen to Dr. Munta. Uh, on, uh, uh, I think he provided a lot of insights on uh, what we can do to improve uh, and uh, strengthen the skill initiative that's currently underway. Uh, I will put in a few points in addition to what uh, Dr. Mantha has already spoken. Um, the points which I will put up uh, will be firstly uh, a very global level view of what's really happening uh, to the whole education system as well as this, the need for skilling that's emerging and how that's so relevant for India. So it's firstly on the very macro level, more like an aeroplane view. And then secondly, looking at our challenges, because I think India is uh, not uh, a regular kind of country. We are both a country and a subcontinent. We are a civilization. So we are far much more uh, complex uh, to, to, uh, to manage than many other countries, which are so much smaller, uh, could be the size of our states, actually. Uh, just for example, I think 1.3 billion, that's our population, is the population of all the 40 countries in Africa continent. So that's the, that's the challenge which you have. So I'll talk a bit of challenge and then finally about the approaches. And in the approaches, already Dr. Muntha has covered quite a bit and uh, uh, I'm in sync with him in uh, nearly all of them in terms of how we should take up stuff. But I'll have some new ideas with reference to the practical reality uh, of how you should be looking at um, skilling uh, at different levels and uh, probably add a few more stuff uh, and then later, uh, depending on question and answers, we can, uh, I, I think, try and answer whatever question you might have. So firstly, looking at education, I think uh, in the in the traditional method and when our education systems were developed, it was more at the time of Industry 2.0. And uh, it was assumed that uh, education will provide the broad backdrop that is necessary, the, the framework that is necessary, and skills will be acquired on the job. So as people go into job, they will learn new skills and uh, they get more and more skills and uh, they go forward. So education system was almost like a factory line that you have class one, two, three, four. It's almost like the same line that you have in a car factory. So this is industry 2.0 and it's education 2.0 in some ways. Uh, I think with the coming of digital revolution, that's the coming of internet in 1990s, things changed. And uh, the, the manner in which... Uh, the industry itself is evolving, uh, has, has, in a way, gone through massive changes uh, because of the digital revolution and the internet coming in. And, and because of that, the education system that uh, we are relying on, uh, there is a bit of gap uh, on, you know, how education eventually converts into skills. And is it too expensive? Dr. Muntha also made me pick, picked up this point. Uh, when I talk to some professors in MIT, there is a MIT education lab. They raised exactly the same question, saying that the expensive education of many of the U.S. universities, that's what they were talking about, they said it doesn't lead to skills that are actually relevant for the job market. And those skills that are relevant for job market are available much more cheaply, but is not really provided by universities. So there's a kind of gap between the two. And they were talking about how do you, how could you actually, uh, in a way, splinter or some way, in some ways, redo the education system that it becomes much more modular. Uh, exactly the type of thing which Dr. Munta said, that you could enter and exit, keep on acquiring additional skills, and with that, educational qualification or credits for that. Uh, but you are not forced to complete a full four-year course only because the degree says that is needed, and, and therefore you are you're, you're making a lot of expense uh, because of that. So I guess the, the changing paradigm in the world where with the coming of internet, with the, with the world of digitalization that's, uh, that's become part of us, and it still is in infancy. And often it is called a, this is called a life transforming technology, as you know. And uh, with, with uh, that being at its infancy and still changing so rapidly, I think the education system needs obviously a revamp and uh, new education policy actually addresses um, most of these issues actually, and therefore, we are lucky that we are moving in the right direction overall. Now, coming to the second part of, of this, and I'm now looking for the industry, industry perspective. 
Uh, there's a very interesting trend uh, that in some ways we must keep at the back of our mind when we talk about skills. And uh, this also will highlight how important the role of government is when it comes to skills. Uh, if you look at data from 1920 till today, uh, pick up any of the countries, major countries in the world, the rate of return to capital and the rate of return to labor. If you look at these two returns, you will find that both of them uh, were more or less steadily moving upwards, but almost in sync. So if there's a graph, then the rate of return to capital will be slightly higher, but almost in the same um, trajectory would be rate of return to labor. And this continued up to 1990, the time when, as I said, the life transforming technology of the internet came in. And then there's a sudden change in the curve. Uh, what's happening after that is rate of return to labor uh, has flattened. Rate of return to capital has shot upward, essentially meaning that uh, if you think of Facebook or if you think of Elon Musk, you realize how technology is leading to huge wealth uh, to, 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 to companies. Whereas uh, on the other hand, the labor, the labor uh, which earlier, because of the rate of return to capital being higher, would get some benefits. So every time an investor puts in money, there is extra money which is generated because the skills the labor had. So there was a sharing that occurred. So there was an increase in wages, real wages of the labor. And this continued and the labor kept on improving the skills. Uh, the rate of return to capital also kept on increasing. That's the trend up to 1990s. After that, it's all technology driven. It's all internet driven. It's all digital driven. And uh, the, 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 the unfortunate part is because this change in technology has been very, very quick and is not stabilized yet. As I said, it's still in infancy. Uh, so therefore, Every time the investors are making money, they are putting more and more of it back into technology, not sharing with the labor. So there is almost that, as I said, a flat re real uh, return of labor. And then that's a matter of concern, actually, globally for many of the economists. Uh, so that's, I think, a trend, which is the end. If now we have to talk about skills, we realize that private sector is unable to do as much as it did in the past. The government has to step in because whenever there is market failure, it becomes the government's responsibility. And that's exactly what... Uh, government of India has been doing as we as we notice. So this is like the broad global trend which uh, uh, you know, I, I'm talking about. Uh, now looking at challenges, and I think uh, I, I mentioned already about India being um, both a country and a subcontinent, or a continent uh, in a way, or equal to almost whole of Africa. So we have to uh, be mindful that when we are trying to solve the problem of the entire African continent, uh, we, how should we think? You know, so. Dr. Muntha actually said it beautifully that we need to think a little more granular. We need to go down uh, in, in our perception of how skills should be uh, attached or attacked. Uh, everything being done at national level, it is good from a technical perspective that you build, build technical capacity, but the real implementation and the real assessment of what's needed has to be very local. And I'm coming to that. I'll just put in a few numbers because that will help you to get a sense of uh, how how challenging our situation might be. So if you look at our total workforce, and I'm just talking about approx appro approximate numbers, these are slightly dated, but more or less uh, about uh, in, in terms of magnitude, what I wanted to express. So our uh, total uh, workforce um, would be about 41.5 crore, uh, of which about 38 crore are actually employed. And there would be about 38.5 approximately, let's say. And there would be about three crore uh, who who are not employed, of which half of them are students actually who are also looking for jobs. So that's how we are as a country. Uh, I think what we need to understand is of these 37 to 38 crore who are employed, 80%, and uh, Dr. Munta mentioned in his category to 75%, so it's almost the same category that we are talking of, the case two which you mentioned. Uh, the 80% of them are actually informal labor. Uh, they are basically people who may not have formal degrees in their hand of what they are doing. But uh, interestingly, they are paid paid by the um, by the industry for the work that they're doing, which essentially implies that they are adding value to the economy. And I'll come to some numbers which indicates how much how much people are earning you know in different quartiles uh, in terms of income. So and then 20% are actually of this 38 crore. We might, we might call them formal, you know, and they are the people who might have degrees and diplomas from colleges, universities even ITIs and others, 80% of them don't, uh, essentially. So that's that's the complex 
complexity of our problem and uh, the problem that we have to solve. Now, looking at the income um, uh, bracket itself, because that gives us a sense that what is the nature of the people whose problem we are going to change or we are going to uh, you know, work towards changing. Uh, if you look at, as I mentioned, for 41.5 crore or 42 crore approximately uh, being our labor force, and I'm just talking of the labor force at the moment, uh, the, the lowest income quartile, the 25 percentile, as I said, you know, the first 20, the first 25 percent of the labor force, they earn uh, either 26,000 rupee or less. So it's up 1,000 rupee per month, per month or less, that's the income that they have. The next income quartile, which is 25th to 50th percentile, they earn between 26,000 to 37,000 rupees per month. Uh, that's their income. Uh, the next one, which is 50th to 75th percentile, earn between 37,000 to 57,000 rupees per month. So that's uh, you know the composition. Anybody who earns above 57,000 rupees per month in India, if the force is actually the top 25% of India's labor force, and that includes all of us, honestly. And anybody who includes, uh, who, who earns more than 88,000 uh, rupees per month is top 10% of India's uh, labor force in terms of, you know, uh, the income that we have. So that's that's how we are. Uh, you know, and I wanted to, to leave this because it also basically gives the pain capacity of people uh, who are and how desperate they might be. Um, for for jobs and therefore their ability or inability to either spare time uh, for for getting skilled or getting educated and the need for their for short term courses as uh, uh, Dr. Muntha said that if it is linked credit wise uh, so that there is a kind of you know even if they spend two months this year and two months next year and two months next to next year they all could be stitched together rather than asking the person that you have to give one full chunk of six months because the, the income uh, ability of that person just may not provide him that opportunity of giving so much of, he doesn't have that luxury of so much of time. So I think keeping keeping that uh, awareness is very important from a uh, policy perspective. So this I, I wanted to uh, convey from a purely um, uh, perspective of uh, the policy and uh, then coming to some of the approaches uh, that uh, we could take. Um, the, firstly, when we talk of skills, we have to reflect that uh, people can have different vision about why skill is necessary. So, and therefore, this is often contested. Uh, should we have a human-centric approach that it is important for um, uh, for an individual to be skilled because that's how the person's life will become better, or should we look at should it be economic-centric? that we want to skill because we want to increase the GDP of the country. And this is a very important distinction because sometimes when you put money into economic um, productivity, it may not lead to uh, welfare of everybody. It may actually lead to increase in GDP. That is possible. But then it's a question of resource division. Eventually, the job of government comes down to resource division, and that's the job of public policy. Now, should you be putting money into things where everybody gets employment and there is more likelihood of employment to everybody? Or should you put money where people necessarily uh, are trained in a way that the GDP of the country grows? You don't care how many people get employed, don't get employed. You know? So th there is a bit of, uh, you'll find a bit of contestation uh, on this idea. And, uh, and, and therefore, uh, sometimes people hold very strong views uh, on, on what, what should be the role of skilling. And, and how should it be delivered? In my view, uh, generally speaking, and including you know some of the uh, I think surveys done in World Economic Forum, I have found that the human-centric approach is what most people uh, feel most comfortable with. Uh, they feel that there is a need to keep human being at the center of any thoughts or any, any effort and skilling. GDP does matter, and uh, yes, it should be a consequence of whatever skilling you do, but it should not be the starting point uh, of it. So because you, you need uh, everybody to have equal opportunity. So there's that equity argument versus efficiency argument, which people can often have. Um, I think whenever you have a human-centric approach, then the role of government becomes very important. And, uh, and therefore, some of the things which are necessary is one is to look at skills and make skills more aspirational. And that's not an easy job. Uh, it's a tougher job. Uh, I think one of the way which, which is the new education policy uh, wants to address this is uh, uh, bringing skills at school level 
and the conversation about skills happening at school level. So that's a very, very important element of the new education policy. And uh, uh, there's a lot of detailed um, thought process uh, that's underway, which I believe will be rolled out in maybe a uh, few months' time. The second thing which I feel very critical, and this is for the government again, is to look, to look at the human-centric need for skills in different parts of the country in a much more granular way. So instead of having a very top-down uh, kind of approach, um, which uh, which is convenient for bureaucracy, honestly, it's very convenient because you are able to account for money, you are able to track it through, uh, through a computer and all that kind of stuff. But what might be needed in a place like Gandachara, which is like a remote part of Tripura, is not the same as what might be needed in Palakkad in Kerala. You know, and, uh, Kifire in Nagaland might require completely different stuff. So the interesting thing is there is enough data with us uh, that we would know what are the human resource position at district level. The, and uh, we would actually know how many people are unemployed at district level, at what age group, what is their qualification. We have enough information about um, at the, at the national level as well as state level that what are the main industries, what are the main um, let's say occupation of people. What are the main belief system of people? Let's say in Kifire versus what is what is it in Palakkad? You know, so I think uh, uh, the need is to make uh, skilling plans which are very uh, granular. That you have to think district and perhaps even lower. You have to make it deeper. It doesn't mean that we don't make state level plan or we don't make central level plan. We do that too. But I think having a very deep district level plan is critical because as I said, that plan is for people who are at 26,000 rupee and less. Or many times maybe 37,000 rupee and less. A central level plan uh, you would be mostly for people who are 88,000 rupee and above. You know, because it's easier that way uh, for, for the big, big part of it. The lower you go, the more closer it gets to people and therefore it becomes more people oriented and, and therefore more likely that it touches the lives of people in a much, much stronger way than if it is made right at the central level. So therefore the need for having using data and making district level, state level and national level plan with focus that districts should have uh, increased capacity and linked to all the things which Dr. Mantha said that there's so much infrastructure actually uh, already available, so much capacity, uh, there would be uh, you know, uh, the need for adding technical capacity at district level on which the focus should be of the national government that how do we ensure there are enough instructors, how do we ensure there are enough equipments and that's that's where I think the planning should be at the national level and state level but more and more of actual action uh, should be at district level so that's something which I very strongly believe in. Another thing which uh, is very important given the number which I said almost uh, let's say 80% uh, of the 30th crore who are in level fours now being already paid by by the private sector for the work that they do and one crore people being added every year uh, uh, you know, into the level fours. Now of these 30 crore who are already employed, uh, who are already employed, who don't have a certification, they are informal, uh, the, the RPL, recognition of prior learning is very, very critical stuff. Um, we have an RPL program in our country. I think it's not uh, the most ideal kind of RPM, but still it is, I found, um, very effective in the field. So just to give you an example of Jaipur Rugs, uh, you know, one of the company in uh, Jaipur, which actually supplies carpets to many of the hotels in the uh, United States and many other countries in Europe uh, also. Uh, they, they conducted RPL and the uh, remote part of uh, Rajasthan, where women who are involved in some parts of that um, the rug which they make, the carpet, uh, they were involved in that and I, I visited them. And I was trying to understand uh, what are the gains, I mean, what is it that they gain? Does it really lead to any benefit? I realized something which was quite amazing that firstly, uh, many of these women who had been actually working on this rug for maybe 20 years, they said that through the RPO process, the first time came to know that what really happens to that product. Because they say that we make a piece of it, a certain part of it, but we have no clue what happens. We just give it to the agent and the agent takes it, he gives us some money. But we don't real, we never realize that it goes so far away. And what they said is, we suddenly feel a great pride in our work. We realize how much value add we do uh, to, to, to countries and, uh, and, the, and the welfare uh, that they bring. So I think that uh, pride is very critical part of anybody who is working. 
And the first first level change was that right. Second, they said, so I think of the 20 women I interacted with, at least half of them said that they had never ever attended a single class in their lifetime. And this was the only time when they attended a class, which was for 12 days or 14 days, which I don't think is adequate, but it's okay. I mean, as I said, it's, a, it's an incomplete kind of RPL uh, from a global perspective, but still good enough. And uh, with that 14 days uh, attending classes, the pride that comes with it, the fact that they, this first time in their life, in, and some of them were as old as 40, 50 year old, and, and the fact that they got a certificate. And they said that this is the only certificate that they have ever got in their life. And they said that they had never got any certificate. So we often don't understand, you know, appreciate how much difference this small stuff can make in the lives of people and how much happiness it brings. But part of the job of, I think, uh, uh, any uh, skill development is also to bring that joy of work, you know, the aspirational value and the belief that, yes, what I am doing is, is good and great and that have been contributing to the larger society's welfare. So RPL actually brings that in a massive way and is, uh, I, I feel, a very important um, uh, tool uh, that should be used in a much larger way because the number of people who need RPL is huge, is massive. If you look at 80% or 30 at crore, that's a massive number. You know, So I think uh, there, there is a need for doing far much more than what we are doing now, which effectively means that one of the fundamental thing about skill, and uh, Dr. Mantra also touched about on this, is about the, that it's not so much about how much you are teaching, who you know, whether you did four hour class or seven hundred hours class. It's about assessment. That do you have a robust system of assessment? I think we should be focusing at uh, how good is our assessment system and how foolproof is our assessment system, either through universities uh, or, or through any institution that we build up. Because if assessments are good, then you are giving a signal to the market that whoever gets filtered through my assessment is somebody of high quality, regardless of how many hours that person might have worked or not worked, because each of us pick up things uh, based on our, our own intrinsic capacity. And some of them might take 10 hours to learn a job, and some of them might just do it in two hours. It doesn't matter as long as you, uh, you know, clear the assessment uh, with uh, the same marks, which basically means that you are equal uh, when it comes to skills. So I think this whole uh, aspect of assessment and how this assessment should be done, uh, we have through SSC, etc., established a certain protocol. Uh, universities have also done something, uh, and they have protocols. But I think we need to work much more deeply on the assessment side and make it much more robust. I feel sometimes that we, instead of spending our time on training centers, uh, which is also necessary in IT as various, various others, I think we should spend equal time on assessment because that's that's the filter through which you can say with conviction that whatever is coming out is going to be useful. And uh, another part which uh, which is essentially is looking at, uh, uh, you know, the self-employment uh, potential because many of these trades or many of the um, service sector occupations, uh, they, they have potential for self-employment. And then how do you link it to bank loans? How do you link it to, uh, to some way of uh, people uh, getting into doing their own business? It's something that we need to reflect on. Um, finally, I think... Uh, when it comes to the private sector, there should be more economic, economic centric approach. They should have a more economic centric approach. Centers of excellence and various other things which private sector has been doing. I'm aware, for example, Mr. A. M. Nayak uh, from Larsen and Tupuru has made a huge center of excellence in, in uh, Mumbai. And, and that's really, really great. I mean, and we require more of such in every city and towns, uh, which are focused towards industry, but is also a kind of standard bearer of what might the best thing uh, in a particular situation may look like. You know, and I think uh, we, we need to project that and we need to encourage private sector to make more of this. Um, at, at the back of our head, we should always keep in mind that the requirement of rural and urban India is going to be very different. Uh, the rural India will become very dependent on government, whereas urban could do with both government and private intervention. Uh, so therefore, focus of government um, thinking more deeply about rural. And within rural, again, looking at how uh, one of the big chunk that we forget is agriculture and, and the fact that there are trendings that's happening. A lot of people from agriculture moving into some of the new trades. For example, these, uh, I, I don't know if uh, many of you know that the Swiggy delivery boys in Bangalore, uh, for example, they come from agricultural background. And the interesting thing about them is while they earn a lot of money, they, all earn, they earn almost 70,000 rupee per month. But they work only four months. And when we ask them that, why do you work for four months? 
they said that because we are used to working four months in agriculture. And then, so sometimes, you know, it's not just about uh, work, but it's also about the culture that comes with the previous, um, uh, previous, let's say, profession that the person might have been practicing. And the need, therefore, that uh, the soft skill part, which uh, Dr. Mantha spoke, uh, becoming critical, that as we skill people into Swiggy and others, they let them know about how cultures differ in agriculture and how the new culture in uh, in a delivery boy job is going to be different and will require a different approach. So these are soft skills part is an equally important part, uh, which uh, Dr. Mantha had touched upon. So I think weaving all of these together is something which we have to reflect on, you know, making things much more granular, making it taking it deeper down to district and uh, maybe the block level is what we have to reflect on too. So these were a few thoughts which I had to share with you. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you, Manish Kumarji. Uh, thanks a lot for giving us insights into the, the large demographic which we have, as you mentioned, earning below 26,000. And you also mentioned about the, uh, the workforce we have and the challenges, uh, not only in terms of implementation and uh, the challenges for rural and urban uh, population and their requirements and then the crisis which we have been facing. Uh, also, you talked about the cultural uh, differences that we are having and that are also affecting the inclination for job as well as for the kind of training one uh, needs to look for. Uh, so, uh, before starting uh, the question answer session, uh, I would request if anybody wants to make any comment, Lalit Kumar sir, you want to make any comment? Uh, in addition to whatever has been spoken, you have also uh, headed a skill university in Jaipur. So if you want to say anything, then, then we can have a question answer session. If you want to ask anything to the uh, two speakers, anybody who has a question, either you can post in the comment section or please raise your hand and uh, then uh, we will call each one of you. Yes, Lalit Kumar sir. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Kuldeep Dattu sir, and thank you, Manta sir and Manish Kumar ji. Uh, it was a very good learning for me. I uh, kept on taking notes from both the presentations. It was a good learning for all of us. Only two things I would like to flag. Number one, a very important issue was there that how to make skill education aspirational. That is a very, very big uh, issue for all of us. How to make it aspirational? We want good plumbers, but we don't want our sons and daughters to be good plumbers or to go to a plumbing schools. Number one. Number two, in Rajasthan, we did some, uh, some innovative uh, exercise by that normally college students who pass out just with degrees of BA become BSc pass course. Their employability is almost nil in the market. So why don't we backload their second and third year courses with those skills which are employable, employable they are in demand in market. For example, a commerce graduate in second or third year can do a course on GST tele. A BA pass course students can do something on event management. A BSc students can do something on Internet of Things. So, you know, small courses, six to six months, eight months. So this kind of synergy, the academics with skilling at college level, so that when they come out, they are employable and they can look forward to career. These are the two points I want to play. Thank you. Manta sir. Uh, you talked about academics, merging academics and skill training. So, would you like to answer? Yeah. No, I mean, uh, the, the making uh, skills aspirational is extremely important, like uh, Manishli said, uh, Lalitji said. And I believe everyone may have similar views, but the larger question is how do we make it aspirational? So, uh, there are, there are, there are, uh, everything is possibly linked to the employment uh, sector at some at some point of time. I mean, we certainly need skills, uh, you know, to grow as a human being. But uh, somewhere along the line, probably we also uh, want to learn so that we are productive enough and can look after ourselves, our families, and so on. <clears throat> now the problem is aspirational uh, must be like i said looked at uh, from the employment perspective and in that sense we have a primary employment sector 
uh, world over, it uh, gives you employment opportunities over 10 to 15 percent. It depends on the produce from the earth, which means mining, agriculture, and so on. Though we say agriculture gives 50 percent employment and, and more than that, it's uh, it's only seasonal, and therefore there is no sustained uh, employment that's available in that sector. The second <clears throat> or the secondary sector is essentially the manufacturing sector. And unless it grows uh, at maybe 30, 40 percent, which has been stagnant at about 16, 17 percent in the country, that cannot produce jobs which are, uh, you know, which which uh, are productive enough. And, and that sector, the secondary sector has a potential to create about uh, 35 percent of employment opportunities. So therefore, what remains is the tertiary sector, and that's the uh, that's the service sector. And there are almost uh, 50, 55 percent job opportunities possible there. So therefore, everybody gets into that space. So even those who are otherwise qualified to be in the secondary sector would probably migrate to the third, third tertiary sector for, because there, there is a job available there. But this doesn't actually look at the aspirational value even in that in that space. So therefore, what one needs to do is uh, look at the industry as to how that is evolving, create, uh, map the uh, the available job roles. I mean, it's a difficult job, but there is some possibility of doing. It's done in some sectors. It's not done in every sector. But if there is something like that possible, uh, which I'm sure it, it, it is, uh, sufficient research is available to do that. Uh, then probably one can connect the training to the actual employment potential. And therefore, one can move people away from uh, an aspirational value that, that centered around acquiring a degree. So if it is also, uh, you know, positioned around uh, getting a decent employment with, with uh, decent emolument, that also probably will raise the aspirational values. And having said all this, there must be a conscious effort to um, uh, create new employment markets. The over a period of time, as the technology changes, the available employment markets get saturated. So therefore, one needs to constantly create new employment markets, uh, create, be innovative in that space and, and things like that. So all that put together probably can uh, uh, address the aspirational value, but it's a very important aspect. Thank you, sir. Uh, um, yes, uh, Sanjay ji, you want to ask a question? Sanjay Ganju ji. Uh, no, I would like. No, I would not like to have ask in question. But if you allow me, I would like to make some observations based on my experience of working in this sector since last twelve years. Yes, please go ahead. Uh, see, my few of my points I would like to you know put across is number one, uh, you know. While the education system in India is getting institutionalized, consolidated, and you know centralized, you know, for example, you have an IIT JE, you have a NEET, you have a Central University Entrance Test. In those sec, you know, educational sectors which are in fact mature to a large extent, because you know uh, those who appear in IITs, those who appear in you know NEET, they have some sort of those students have some sort of maturity. They have at least gone through you know. A process of you know studying after 12 but still we find that there are there are you know institutional faults there are faults within the students so we have institutionalized this so that a cream comes up to those institutions which have been you know you know created in the central level but unfortunately in uh, the skill space which is a um, to some to a, to a large extent uh, raw immature and you know informal in character uh, we have you know, try we we try to de deinstitutionalize it. We have uh, decentralized it by creating you know the sector skill councils and many you know uh, many uh, such institutions for assessment. And you know uh, even for imparting training, uh, if we are we are day by day creating new IITs, we are creating new IIMs, we are creating new central universities to create a you know. Uh, an, an uh, educational ecosystem which is competent, which is uh, excellent, 
but in unfortunately in this uh, skill set which needs this more is you know institutionalized and i talk to uh, some ministers also you know in with this guys so why don't we create a thousand uh, iits uh, itis of national level you know why don't we create thousands into not not with 1000 thousands of them you know where the uh, quality comes up but unfortunately in this sector why we have uh, unfortunately uh, you know i shouldn't say demolished it we say we have you know uh, unfortunately done, done injustice to the sector by uh, by setting up the, a new uh, system which has demolished the tra traditional itis uh of the country uh today uh, you know iits uh, itis have become uh, most you know neglected kind of a, a set of institutions so but the importance of itis let me tell you today the long term training is still important if you have if maruti has to employ a, 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 a technician he will never go to his sector skill automobile sector skill council to get a three months trained you know uh skill uh, skilled worker he will go he will still go to iti because he knows that in iti in whatever condition he is he one year course which he has done in an automobile is more you know uh, you know uh, more uh, successful than the training which he has conducted in three months so this is one point which i wanted to make i think this needs to be rethought the centralization of uh, i must say Uh, these technical institutions these skill development institutions should happen there has to be you know assess you know assessment system which is controlled by government which used to be earlier with dgt unfortunately that has been dismantled now these sector skill councils have mushroomed up uh, and the new character which has come up unfortunately when this nsdc was set up i was in fiki you know fiki became a stakeholder of nsdc the idea behind was nsdc why it was kept in under ministry of finance was providing a you know a uh, fee based uh, those who cannot afford training the, it was a kind of loan to the uh, you know those beneficiaries so that they take a loan from uh, these uh, say, you know nsdc and take a training and go to the industry for employment but later it was shifted to ministry of skills i don't know why and the traditional dgt was totally dismantled and it was totally you know uh, brought out of uh, the scene uh so instead of strengthening the traditional uh, ncbet uh, which used to be the assessment uh, you know system of the country uh, unfortunately they these uh, sector skill councils have come not only uh, you see the corruption definitely happens uh, even in government but now what has happened is corruption plus favoritism that is the norm now. so these sector skill councils unfortunately have not been have not been able to you know come up to uh, the uh, expectations with the result whatever you know uh, what whatever uh, whatever uh, objectives were were set up uh, were set up for you know skilling in india could not be met you know there were many objectives that industry specific uh, skills will be you know uh, created because the sector skill councils are set up by industry but unfortunately these sectors and councils have become air money making in you know, institutions for industry associations i have worked with chambers and associations you know for almost 12 13 years and i know what they are doing so uh, you know for a small example a trainer has to every year he has to go for uh, you know retraining and assessment just because sector skill council wants to some fee out of it so if if a trainer is trained in a particular skill do you think that in one year he will forget about that skill just because sector skill wants skill council wants to make money this tot has to happen and for every certification they you know the, the huge money is taken uh they 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 are, they, they are count money so the my, my, so my point another point with regard again to the sector skill council is this this framework i'm talking about if industry has taken responsibility of setting up a curriculum they are doing the assessment so why don't they provide an employment also i you know many forums i have talked about this but uh, nobody wants to you know uh, give heed to this uh, so at least if why it is the, the responsibility only of the uh, you know implementing agency to provide placement so if you have created a curriculum you are doing the assessment so you should uh, very well give the employment also 
uh, if an automobile sector skill council is set up by ACMA or a construction sector skill council is set by the BCCI and thousands with thousands of you know contractors and you know uh, you know employers under their belt. So why don't they employ? So that that means the, the curriculum which they have set up or the assessment they are doing that is faulty. So they they themselves are not willing to you know uh, through their members are not willing to employ. So I think it, we need to make this sector you know skill system uh, uh, you know more simple and. Uh, also, another point, India is 95 percent unorganized sector. Unfortunately, the st systems and structures created by NSDC are more tilted towards the 5 percent organized sector. You know, where, uh, you know, I was working with Ministry of Rural Development on a project. So, we had to provide the, you know, these uh, placement, uh, you know, uh, what you call uh, uh, certificate, you know, we had to prove the, uh, give the proofs of placement. So I, 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 I once talked to the joint secretary there. I said, you, please, can you check with the, uh, at your reception, the guard which you have employed, uh, does he get the salary in his account? Because I just checked while entering to your office, I checked with him uh, and he told me that, sir, I am getting cash. So if your own, you know, security guard is not able to get salary in, you know, uh, in his account, how do you expect that? Thousands, you know, lakhs and lakhs of, you know, tra you know tra these uh, trainees will be able to get employment in such companies where a, a pay slip is given, where, uh, you know, uh, this uh, money is transferred into the account. So it is impractical. So you have to find ways to address this unorganized sector. How to employ a person in agriculture? How to employ a person in handicrafts? How to employ a person in agriculture? You know this uh, unorganized sector. So uh, just because the you know policy makers want uh, that they should there has to be uh, what you call uh, some sort of uh, uh, what you call uh, documented kind of system. So these things are unnecessarily forced on uh, the uh, you know ecosystem of uh, skilling. So I think there are many things which we need to address on, and then only the skill skilling can can be improved. Uh, there should be more discussion with implementing agencies. There should be more discussions with assessment agencies what they are doing and what and the employers. You please, Kolibri, uh, I guarantee I was I travel a lot. I go to these industrial clusters. Tell me even a single cluster in India. I was at Surat uh, last week. I traveled to Ahmedabad. I used to, you know, to Punjab, you know, all these industrial clusters. Go and check with any industry, those small industries, those who employ five people, ten people. Check with them. Not even a single person is has come, uh, you know, in their fold through this scaling system. So, so what is the purpose then? Agar abhi bhi ustad hi, you know, ek worker ko sikhayega, go to the, any automobile market. Go check and, you know, not even a single worker in automobile industry, automobile clusters is has come from the skill system. So if the same Ustad has to do it, so and then what we do is every five years, ten years, we scrap the old scheme and try to create new schemes. Ab pehle stars tha, uske baad PM ne one aaya, fir two aaya. Similarly, rural mein pehle SGSY tha. We think that by reinventing the scheme. We are we will be able to address the gaps. We don't, you know, focus on the gaps available in the existing, which has been, you know, and try to plug it and try to, you know, set it up right, set up right, the things right. No, just throw it out and bring a new thing. So this is not going to work. Uh, you know, I we work on ground. I have been working. I have been. I worked in the both sides. I worked in Fiki for twelve years, the industry side. And I am now working on the, you know, uh, this side, scaling side also, and grassroots level, the interiors, Naxal areas, northeast, Jammu and Kashmir, you know, far flung areas. And in those scaling sectors where, where you know, uh, not city based service retail, I am not doing that. I am doing construction, I am doing, you know, uh, toughest skill. But I understand, uh, you know, uh, what is happening in this. Uh, uh, let me be honest with you the skill mission. To a large extent, has failed. Thank you, Sanjay ji. Uh, being in, uh, you can say uh, joining here and then giving you uh, field experience, real life experience, and sharing with your uh, sharing your experiences with all of us. 
particularly our uh, speakers. Uh, before uh, asking uh, our speakers to respond, I will take a couple of more questions. Um, uh, Dr. Varun, you have uh, raised your hand and uh, Brigadier uh, uh, Jeevan Rajpurohit has also raised. Varunji, yes, uh, please yeah, you uh, can ask your question. Good evening. My question is to uh, Dr. Mandaji. So uh, this is about the two points that I picked up from uh, uh, your PPT. So you were talking about cognitive flexibility as a skill for 2020. Are you one of those uh, you know, global reports? And also when we you in your slide about NEP multidisciplinarity. Right. So I somewhere feel these two are very connected. And my question is basically, even though the topic for today is skill, my question is regarding at the border of skill versus general education. So when we look at skill, it's more from the employability perspective. Now there is always a concern or a doubt which has, which comes that should we focus more on depth or that is creating experts or should we focus more on breadth, which is basically multidisciplinary skill where people are flexible. Now, what will be the, when we focus, when, our, when we bring our focus to cognitive flexibility and multidisciplinary learning and employment focus, what will be its impact on the overall innovation capability in the country? Are we moving away from creating experts and to move, moving towards more towards generalists who are capable at, you know, multiple things at multiple levels? or uh, will our focus on multidisciplinary skill development would have a positive impact towards innovation in a secondary as a secondary consequence or a long term consequence? So, this is related to that idea or the general dichotomy we talk about, you know, uh, depth versus breadth or expertise versus uh, generalizable skills. So, that is my question. What will be the impact of this on innovation? Uh, thank you, Varunji. Uh, Mantaji, oh, please uh, respond yeah. and we'll take a question from uh, Brigadier Jivan Raj. Yeah. Uh, so when I uh, see within the skill uh, domain, multidisciplinarity would uh, actually uh, not be looked at in the same sense as we talk about multidisciplinarity in, in a higher education sector. In a what I actually meant was there are today uh, skill programs which uh, are given by the uh, training centers based on the you know skill uh, documents that are created by the SSEs and and so on. Uh, the training that is given is at a certain level and of a certain uh, in a certain sector. Now <clears throat> the Unfortunately, the industry is not so, uh, you know, nicely, uh, you know, so discreet in absorbing somebody at uh, trained at level four in some, let's say, the tourism industry or maybe the hotel industry or whatever, or the automobile industry level four. I mean, those kind of jobs really don't exist. So, what actually one requires is group the skills in the same sector and provide maybe three, four skills in order to become employable. They, they cannot be disparate uh, skill, uh, you know, grouping I mean, from different sectors and things like that. In the safe sector, if you can group, let's say, three, four levels of, uh, you know, skill sets, then probably that has a larger chance of being employable than uh, just uh, making uh, let's say a plumber at level four or things like that, you know. So uh, that's that's one uh, point. The second is, I mean, there are there are several uh, things which uh, uh, Sanjay ji uh, referred to, and they all have a very close connect to some of the questions that you have asked and and things like that, you know. Uh, I mean, the the implementation has been. Uh, faulty. I mean that that's that's something that uh, we have been seeing for a period of time. I have also interacted with several training providers and the way they train and the, the kind of difficulties they have, and so on. And therefore, there is also another. Uh, uh, there there is a certain reimbursement that happens uh, if uh, if they are able to place the students, uh, and there is a certain reimbursement that happens. If they are not able to place the students, some 60%, 65% of 
something of that uh, kind. Now, there is an inbuilt uh, feature. This is an inbuilt feature for failure. Now, uh, what happens is people tend to make their entire proposals on that 60% basis, assuming that I can't place the students. So, subsequent to that, the entire supply chain works. The supply chain of getting student, training him, and you know, allowing him to go to go into the system, so on. But having said all that, there there is a course correction required. There is a certain amount of uh, uh, connect. I mean that what you are talking about that uh, the connect between uh, the skills uh, that are required in the same sector but at different levels. And for example, if somebody could find a job in a construction sector as maybe a site supervisor. You know, having been trained for a certain group of uh, skills. But if he were to be trained only in, let's say, bar bending, and uh, he would probably go out to looking for a job, I, I don't think that uh, really works. So that was the connect, uh, that was the uh, uh, idea with which I tried to connect. Uh, I tried to talk about the multidisciplinarity. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, Brigadier uh, Jeevan Rajpur Ji. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Kuldeep. It is indeed a privilege to listen to uh, the August speakers, uh, Mantha sir, Manish sir. It's wonderful. And and uh, I must compliment uh, Sanjay Ji for what candid uh, comments you made with respect to the uh, country. I, I wonder if all of us can put together to what you said and bring out the uh, ultimate crux of employment to our youth. My question pertains primarily to both of them and uh, uh, Mantha sir would be able to answer me specific. But before I go to the question, I'd like to quote uh, two aspects. One is that when a student goes to school, to college and then onwards to his career, the West talks about college readiness, career readiness, work readiness and finally the job readiness. And Kautilya in Arthashastra spoke about asking each student at the age of 11, 16, 21 and 25 as to how he or she would like to progress in respective career. And depending on wherever one wants to deviate from education, the skill is there and he or she gets into the skill. To the extent that he said women who want to be prostitutes, the level of those prostitutes were defined and they used to be employed. That's how possibly the welfare state whether it's economics defense or strategizing he could place each individual in the slot which is required to be catered and then creating the correct mass for that slot having said these two aspects my question still remains that skill centers our individual homes our schools our colleges are they really geared towards creating an individual who's an asset to the nation or are we creating organizations and then attempting to fit into wherever possible? And in the bargain, we say 30%, 40%, 90% success achieved or otherwise. I would like to throw some light on practical aspects of this. I'm a practitioner who's been doing it all across in the services. And now I have uh, thousands of rural youth with me whom I'm trying to uh, give that out. But it's too far difficult. I find the gap is huge. He says graduate, but he can't write a simple application in Hindi or English. So that's the kind of gap in skill acquisition. They say, they do say, Sharirasya guna nascha, duramadhyantaram, antaram, shariram kshanam vidhvansati, kalpant saino guna. It is the guna which will, which will be continuing, not the sharir or the uh, aspects. Like to throw some lights up. Thank you. Uh, I'll give you uh, a counter to what uh, you have said. There were and and the way the system seems to be operating and the way we try to be we are trying to you know uh, modulate the entire uh, working. There was a time I mean when I was the chairman uh, of the AICT, people uh, were constantly questioning as to why institutions were being given permission to work to new institutions when there are, there are people who are already unemployed and things like that. You know, so on the contrary, what was happening was institutions were coming, saying that they, they there are employment opportunities in a certain 
discipline in certain branch of engineering and therefore they want to expand only in that area <clears throat> now this is based on perception there is no real data that is uh, available now when we try to put a stop on this they went to court now the court asked a very simple question we we said that we want to stop the proliferation because there is a deficit in quality that we are seeing so the court said how do you presuppose that there will be a deficit of quality in a new institution that comes up you have a regulatory job you check the institutions which are there now and maybe close them but you cannot stop doing that for two three reasons one is you have the the fundamental right 19g which says that you can practice any profession that you want the second is you have you you are putting in your own money and your own the land belongs to you the government doesn't come in any of these issues and how do you stop him from setting up an institution so what was happening was the institutions on one side were working on perception they feel that there are jobs in it is there for every brand. in fact they were closing down mechanical they were closing down civil and starting uh, computer science it and just because they perceived that there were employment opportunities in there it was never connected through a, a system that was based on data and metrics same thing is happening in skills we assume that there is a certain job available somewhere so everybody they, or for the skill center they feel that there is there is a certain uh, these skill is uh, easy to be uh, done and uh, you don't need too much of infrastructure and therefore they create a business model out of that and if it suits them they do it otherwise there are also skills which are needed to be done they are also um, they also have employment potential but doesn't do that i mean there were there are uh, industry bodies cii you have uh, fiki you have asusha i'll ask a very simple question whether it's skills or higher education or whatever have they ever given you a single report which actually connects how many engineers you require how many plumbers you require how many i mean you can add 10 15% over that or 20% over that and create and design your entire scaling system to accommodate that that doesn't seem to be happening we are only working on somebody's perception somebody's idea somebody feels so and so therefore we go and do it tomorrow if somebody says that there are uh, jobs as construction supervisors i i i will uh, uh, i mean uh, say this without hesitation that every, every skilling center would start doing that so somewhere we need a larger plan there must be a mapping of what is happening with the industry what kind of jobs are available the industry bodies must be made more responsible and they must come out with some kind of figures which can be depended on in fact when, when i asked nascom as to why uh, they can't reveal the numbers you know that are uh, of uh, different uh, expertise you know re requirement within the industry they said that many of the it industries do not want to reveal that because they their business interest will be uh, you know will be jeopardized and they uh, would not want to answer such questions because the other fellow in the business would know uh, you know what kind of job this fellow is up to so if this this is the kind of uh, ecosystem we have we need to really uh, rethink uh, sorry to interrupt that is why i said that they should be made more answerable if they are making yes. money through certification by just stamping the certificates and not even paying the assessor the assessor is also paid by the training provider because if he doesn't pay him they will not uh, you know uh, qualify him as a uh, trained candidate so th they are just making money they should be made answerable na? if they have devised the curriculum they are doing the certification let them provide employment of 25% otherwise close these shops let government do it if they are not i have seen the segments of the kind of industry representations they have wo ek you know uh, marketing wale ko bhejte hain sector skill counseling meeting mein jiska koi matlab nahi hai and he is on their panel he is on their board he doesn't know what you know see about the said curriculum and he sits on their they have all kept these consultants that no representative from industry they design their curriculum aap sab ka dekhiye jo nos ye sab bana rakhe hain unhone they are all done by a consultant single consultant and he supplies this material to them not a single percentage of you know participation from the industry so i think by now nsdc should have observed this and closed these shops that's it 
Manish Kumar ji, you can conclude and then we can uh, conclude this uh, webinar. Yes, there okay. were some questions pointed at you also, NSDA, NSDC and all those issues. Yeah. yeah. So thank you so much. And uh, I do appreciate the good points which uh, Sanjay Ganduji made. But I think uh, there are different responsibilities for different, you know, this is a work which requires different section of society to come together in a way. And the uh, government is doing its part. And there would be need for, you know, the um, different, let's say, bodies to do their part too. So if I look at, for example, FIKI, FIKI is responsible for at least four or five sector skill councils. And they are the ones who created them. And uh, therefore, they should actually write saying that we don't believe in these. Uh, and that they should be closed. They should write on their own if they believe in that. And they should write to the government, honestly. I mean, I don't see ever Fiki writing that well. I created them, but I don't believe in them. So having created somebody you don't believe in them, you must write. I mean, you should be bold enough. Second, I think there is a social issue here. So if you look at, you know, the nature of business, and I hinted that in the beginning, what is, what is the problem if you look at, you know, in terms of um, India is the surplus that we have in labor terms. Most of the most of the people in industry, um, as far as possible, and for good reasons, because their job is to make profit, would want to give as low as possible to the uh, to the labor. And I, I hinted this. And the, many cases, and we know this, is below the minimum wages for that particular state. Is below that. We have done a survey even to understand, you know, what is the money which, for example, an average uh, newcomer gets when he joins industry. And what is his expectation or her expectation in life? What we found was interesting that they get about 8,500, sometimes as low as 4,000 sometimes, you know, which is far below minimum wage. It's almost half of minimum wage. And uh, then they, their expectation of life is 18,000 rupees per month. So this there was a complete mismatch between what a youth is expecting today and what the industry is willing to give. And I, I understand the point of view of industry that Given the economic realities of India, if they paid 18,000, they will all go into loss. You know, so it's not really practical. They will say the, the interest rate is so high. How can we, you know, pay so much and thereafter still make profit? So they have a point. So I, what I was trying to say is there's a, there is a responsibility at different ends and each of them is actually trying the best and will have to try the best to get, get things going. There's one more important thing. Like if you look at the big group that we are here, most of us will have drivers, household workers, you know, how many of us are in contractual relationship with them? Have we ever issued? Like we talk about formalizing. And if you look at why, what government is trying to do, everything that they try to do is to formalize. They want the government, they want people to be formalized. You know, they want people to prosper. The government's focus is always that, that how can I make people more prosperous? If the youth is wanting not 8,500, but 18,000, how should I slowly lead towards that? I think at least we as individuals, what we can do, I think we should look at that. You know, can we at least formalize people who work with us or we want to just keep them, uh, you know, j just as non-contracted workers. So partially it's also social responsibility. It's a cultural issue, honestly. If you look at the law of the land, each of us are doing that illegally because the labor law actually requires us to issue them contracts. You know, and and if, we're, if we were in a different country, if you are in the U.S. and you are following, if you are employing somebody, you'll follow the rule because somebody will come to your home and hold you accountable for that if you don't do that. So I think partially we have to reflect inwards also. Blaming government for everything is not wise. That's my you know, honest belief, having worked in government for a long time. Because I do see a lot of good intention on behalf of government. But I think you know the challenge is heavy. Uh, as I said, it's 1.3 billion. It's Africa, 40 countries almost. So therefore, different parts of uh, the community coming together, appreciating what's right, what's wrong. I don't think so we differ in terms of what's wrong. Right? I mean, we want to sort that out. If SSCs are not working, let's go down. Yeah. But let's begin from the people who actually set it up, saying that this doesn't work. I created six. I'm going to write that these six don't work. And I am fully with you, Sanjayji, that why should the SSC, you know, have 20, 30 people from industry in the board and not one person being actually employed by, by those industry leaders? That's very common. You know, we have seen that. And you're exactly the same argument that you have made, I made, you know, internally, uh, not, not externally. So, so I guess it's, it's, it's very important that we see things in perspective, realize, yes, uh, government is trying its best. Um, if you look at, you know, the first job of any government is to bring things into the social agenda. I think it has succeeded well by today, at least people talk about skills, 
they, they understand his value. That's why we are having this, this webinar. The fact that we differ is a very good thing because that's the difference is actually leads to discussion and you know betterment of our of our system and better belief system also. So that shows that the agenda setting part is done. It's hardly seven years. Uh, you know, uh, it started in 2015. If you look at the ministry, and it's 2022, just seven years. Their education system is like ten times older. So you'll find at least you know, examples of excellence. I guess Sanjayji is right that we now need centers of excellence. How do how do you create those you know those institutions of excellence as as we can call them? That can we have IIT equivalents in ITIs? You know how 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 should we think about it? I think it's time for that. I, I guess new education policy is fully seized on that. And my own faith uh, that you know things are moving in the right direction is high. Uh, I do believe that we are moving in the right direction. Yes, uh, are we uh, in, in good condition? No, I wouldn't say that. Yeah, I mean we are perfect. We'll never say that. We have much to do, and we need to move forward for that. Uh, but I did enjoy this discussion, and thank you so much for being frank and uh, honest and what you believe in. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you, everyone. Everyone, uh, thank you, sir. Thank you, Manta sir. Thank you, Manish Kumar ji. It was very good uh, to hear you and to have a very you know, fruitful, very productive uh, discussion. Mm -hmm.